So hello everybody and welcome to our first ever virtual consultation webinar for North East Cambridge uh, Draft Area Action Plan. My name is Paul Freyner and I'm the Assistant Director for Strategy and Economy and I'm going to be presenting tonight with a number of my colleagues to help you understand what the consultation is all about. Um, just to say this is quite a strange experience because I can't see any of you so I don't know who's there and I feel like I'm talking to myself a little bit and this is a bit of our bit of a test and see really because it's our first ever session um, with this kind of this kind of version of consultation and um, so with, this is one of eight sessions that are going to be running over the summer and um, supporting this 10-week um, North East Cambridge AAP consultation and to remind you all that uh, that ends on the 5th of October and the last webinar will be on the 21st of September. So firstly we've got a few housekeeping bits um, and then I'll introduce you to the team um, and let you know the setup for the, for the evening. Um, the question and answer is an hour long um, I appreciate that seems like quite a short time but there will be opportunities to ask questions and all of those questions that we have not answered by the end of the session will be picked up through the function on Zoom and we'll be answering them on the website afterwards. Um, what we're going to try to because of the short amount of time, we have experts for each particular session on each of the panel topics. So we're going to try and keep the topic as far as possible, but there will be people here to answer most of your questions. Um, so there's a slide presentation first, which gives a bit of a topic overview followed by some initial question and answer slides, which we've had already come through. Um, and then there'll be opportunities for attendees to ask questions, which will be answered live. Um, the question and answer session is being recorded and will be available on both the City and the South Cairns District Council YouTube channels and social media after the session for those who can't make the event. Um, you're all invisible from view. I'm not, so I hope I haven't got any dogs or children coming into the background while I'm while I'm talking. But if not, that's just the way we are now, isn't it? I suppose. And um, you can post with a name, or you can post anonymously. And um, it's down to you. And um, there's no chat facility, and you'll have to use a question and answer function, which is at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I'll, I'm going to introduce my co-presenter. Um, and we'll go around the perimeter. So, introduce an official presenting track to. Hi, everybody, and thanks very much for coming along. Um, so, my name's Hannah Loftus. I'm Special Projects Officer with the Shared Planning Service. Um, and um, I've been working, as some of you will know, on the consultation and the area action plan development. I believe Joe is going to share some slides in a minute. Um, we're just going to, we thought it would be useful, especially because it's really early on in the consultation and we know that not everyone will have had the chance to necessarily read or digest all the information about the area action plan to just give you, I suppose, a very edited highlights of what is in the plan, why we're doing it, and what you can kind of comment on and, and the sort of feedback that is helpful to us through this. So I'm just going to go through a very few slides um, once they come up and um, talk you through just a few of those very um, sort of essential things really about what the area plan is about. Just to put North East Cambridge in context, it is a really big area of brownfield land in the middle of you know, what is obviously a very growing region for us. And so it's important that we use that land as well as we possibly can. It has good transport accessibility, and we know that that's going to improve over the coming decades. Um, we already have things like the Chisholm Trail, obviously, and the Water Beach Greenway, but we know that there's things like the Cambridge Autonomous Metro on the horizon as well. It has a range of landowners and so one of the really important things about the area action plan is that we want everybody who develops in this area to be signed up and to be in line with a single vision so it is coordinated so we aren't, aren't ending up with lots of different developments that are all trying to do different things but actually it adds up to a really fantastic place to live and work for many many years to come. Um, and also it is of course very strategically important and 
it's not just about that wider region, but it is about Kings Hedges and Arbury and Chesterton and Milton and all the other communities around it. And it really is a way of knitting together a lot of things that at the moment feel quite severed and segregated. Next, please. So just what is an area action plan? Some of you may well ask this pretty important question. It is a high, highly important piece of the planning framework about guiding development. It sets out spatial framework and the thematic policies, which all development in the area will have to bear in mind when it comes forward. And our planning officers, once the area action plan is adopted, our planning officers will be looking at the area action plans policies and asking if the planning applications that come in meet the requirements of those policies and if not they will be negotiating or if necessary refusing on that basis. So it is a really important framework and hence it does go through a very very thorough process there is a huge amount of evidence-based work that's been done already and is ongoing so that is everything from housing through to environmental issues and so forth and then it will go through an examination process as well similar to what a local plan would go through so it is a, a thorough and, and i'm afraid also a lengthy document but we have tried to make it as easy as possible for you all to understand a bit about how we got to this point. There's two issues and options consultations that happened. I think this is the next slide, Joe. Um, the two issues and options consultations that happened um, in 2014 and 2019. We have had a lot of engagement with both community members, ward members, um, and executive members, of course, as well as the landowners and so forth. Um, and of course, one of the key things here is that there is a central government. Um, backing in a way to some of the ideas behind the area action plan because they are funding the relocation of the wastewater treatment plant on the basis that this site provides the opportunity for a really significant amount of new homes and jobs. Next one. This is the vision that we're consulting on and this is really the central thing that we want everybody's feedback on um, alongside the central policies and the, the, the key aims and aspirations of the area action plan. It is about low environmental impact, walkability, a really innovative approach to a new low carbon approach to development. And it is very much about mixed use. This is about homes, workplaces and community facilities really well integrated, not only with each other, but with surrounding neighbourhoods. Next one. Just a few headline figures. As I mentioned, it's 182 hectares of brownfield land. At the moment, there are 15,000 jobs across the science parks and the business parks and the industrial areas on the site, but only three homes. So a really key aim is that we want to balance that and provide homes where they have this fantastic access to jobs, as well as to the transport links that enable people to access other jobs around the area sustainably without using their cars. So it will be about 8,000 new homes, which is about 18,000 people, um, and also more business space as well. A significant amount of public parks and, and green spaces, and a lot of social infrastructure as well, in terms of the three primary schools that are planned, as well as things like library, arts facilities, and much more. Next, please. This is about it being for everybody, and I think this is a really important thing that runs throughout the Area Action Plan, and certainly, the executive members who from both councils feel very strongly about this. It is not just about supporting the tech and R&D sectors, although they are really important. It is also about keeping a range of space for light industrial business, small business startups, which creates that range of jobs that existing local residents can access. And that thing about being for everybody is also about the housing that is created. It is about that mix. We're ta targeting 40% affordable housing across the whole area. Um, and it's not just one type of affordable housing, that's council and social rented, but also shared ownership and so forth. So mix is a very important theme running throughout the area action plan. Next, please. The other really key theme, I think, is that the uh, walkability and the cyclability of the area is coming first. This is quite different from a lot of other development. I think you know we're used to seeing not just in our area but around the country. But we are putting a massive priority on saying this is not about designing for the car. This is about designing for active travel and public transport first, and that that should be there from day one, so that people who move into the area 
get into great habits of using walking, cycling and public transport. Of course, there will be the ability for a central car use, essential deliveries and so forth. And if you are disabled or you have additional needs, but we really want everybody as far as possible to help meet the climate change targets that we have. And also, you know, we know from COVID how air quality and walking and cycling is just incredibly important for well-being. So it's really important that this is put front and centre in the plan, even though that's quite a challenge as well. Next, please. Just a little bit about what is going where on the site. So it is structured around four new centres, which are the kind of hubs for activity in the area. In the middle, you can see the district centre. That's the kind of main new centre that will be created, where there'll be the kind of library, main community facilities, shops, restaurants, as well as a primary school. Then there are three smaller centres, one near Cambridge North Station, which it starts to extend what's already happening there in terms of the hotel and so forth, but adding things like local shops so that people who are working or passing through the area can access what they need. There is a neighbourhood centre up near St John's Business Park, which will have another primary school and some local shops. And that will really be about both serving St John's itself, but also the new residential areas near there. And then finally, a local centre near the Science Park. And that will be a really fantastic way of integrating the existing communities with some of the other activity across the site, because it will be right on the boundary, if you like, between those two things. So it's a key way of creating more activity there, getting more mix, more opportunities and so forth. Um, next slide, please. There are many new and improved cro crossings in the area. Those are about overcoming existing barriers to movement. And this is again, really important for the integration point. These have been planned alongside thinking about how the Water Beach Greenway and the Chisholm Trail and other improvements will come into the area, but also crossing Milton Road, which is of course, quite a substantial barrier to movement right now. So there are uh, different ways that we are looking at crossing that, both an underpass, also a bridge, and also a much improved kind of multi-way junction between Milton Road and the guided busway. So those will be really important ways of, of improving the way that people can move around the area as seamlessly as possible, and again, without using the car. And finally, on the next slide, there's new green spaces, and again, this is key. It is a green network through and through. It is not just about one sort of single park. It is about a real network of green spaces that runs all the way from Milton Country Park down to the south of the site, connecting up to the Cam and Chesterton Fen to the east and into the existing mature landscapes of the Science Park, and it, which are going to be retained and improved as part of the plan. I am giving a very high level run through because I know we've got lots of questions already, which is great. We have some really robust but ambitious energy and water use targets. This is very much part of the, both councils ambition to meet the net zero carbon challenge. So we are really looking for people and developers on this site to go above and beyond. That's not just about how buildings are built, of course, in terms of how energy efficient the fabric is. It is also about those good habits so that people who live in them are using less energy naturally and instinctively rather than being kind of forced to, if you like, and then also about how they travel around the area. So we've just got a few questions that um, have already been coming through and we've been seeing a lot of really great debate already on our Facebook pages and on social media. So we were gonna kick off with those and then go on to the questions that we can already see coming in um, on the Q&A. Thanks, Hannah. That's really, really helpful, I think, to set some context. I think what I'm going to do quickly first is I'm going to run around our panel who we've got here today to talk through some of these for you. And um, also, I think I'm going to keep an eye. If you can see me looking off to the side, I'm going to keep an eye on my screen because I think some of my um, audio went and if it gets a bit bad, I will switch off so you don't get to see my face, which is probably not all that important anyway. So just quickly, what I'd like to do is just introduce our panel um, our panel who's going to be answering some of the questions for you. So I'm going to go across to Matt Patterson first. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Patterson. I'm the project lead, if you like, for the Shared Planning Service developing the Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan. Uh, and that involves uh, both the policy teams across the councils and draws on um, services across both councils as well as the county as well. Thanks, Matt. Um, Terry? 
Good afternoon, evening, uh, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm Terry D'Souza. So I'm a principal planning policy officer for the shared planning service, uh, and I've been working with Matt and the rest of the team in pulling the plan together and working on the evidence-based documents that sit behind it. Thanks, Terry. And notwithstanding, obviously, the, the Hannah and myself on the panel, there's a few people behind the scenes doing some really helpful stuff with getting this um, live for you. So I won't introduce them because they've asked me not to. There's, um, there's, a, there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes with this. So as um, Hannah has already mentioned, we had some pre-asked questions. Um, so we'd kind of really like to kind of answer these as, to kick things off and then we'll get on to your three questions as it were. So I'm going to hand over to Terry who's going to pick up the first question. So Terry, if you want to ask a question, um, read out the question and give your answer, that'd be great. Yep, sure. So the first question is uh, what kind of homes will be built? So that's a, a really good question. So the area of action plan um, um, identifies that the site could deliver 8,000 homes uh, between now and 2040. So as Hannah mentioned in her presentation, we're looking for a real mix of housing. We're not just looking for, for just one type. So as part of that, 40% um, is the target that we'll be looking for for affordable housing. Now, affordable housing is uh, a kind of an umbrella term, really, for, for quite a lot of different types of housing. So as part of that 40%, percent we will be looking for a mix of social and council homes, uh, intermediate homes, uh, and such as key worker housing, uh, and low-cost home ownership, such as shared uh, shared ownership models. Um, so there'll be a real diverse sort of mix there of, of not only housing, but also uh, different types of affordable housing. Um, what we're also looking at is something called self-finished homes. Now that's something that um, isn't very um, sort of uh, quite isn't a very common type of home in the UK uh, at the moment. But there's definitely a lot of merit in them. Essentially, what you would normally get for sort of self-build is people would acquire a plot somewhere and they would build their own home I think I'm sort of like grand designs really essentially what self-finished homes is is that you could design the internal layouts within an apartment block now because of the high density nature of North East Cape which is what the plan's looking at it, uh, we think that self-finished homes would be a, a lot more appropriate and lend itself a lot better than than self than self-build in the more traditional way um, in terms of the types of homes, they would be predominantly flatted developments, so that would be a range of one, two bedroom flats, but also some larger ones as well. So making sure that we're making provision for, for, for um, larger households. Uh, and there'd also be a scattering of houses as well within, within the site, but predominantly it would be a flatted, develop, uh, flatted development across the site. And then finally, just in terms of the, the range of heights um, that we're looking at, uh, we've done some work already uh, and it says that we could go around the edges of the site um, four to five stories um, could be accommodated and then that would gradually increase as you as you work your way into the center of the site so kind of where the district center is proposed on cowley road so roughly at the moment where the golf driving range is that uh, development could be uh, up to 13 stories in that area now we are doing some further work on building heights with um, Historic England, um, but at the moment uh, the, the plan says that we could build between four and 13 storeys. Thanks Paul. Thank, thanks Terry, thanks for that question. I'm going to try tentatively my video game while we pick up this next question, we'll see how it goes. So I'm going to pick up this question. So. <laughs> Let's start really right at the beginning. Why are we even developing the site? Um, and I suppose it's important to note if this site wasn't available, the development of new homes would need siting elsewhere locally to deliver the housing need within the area. Um, and also just to note that this is a huge opportunity really, just by the site's location, it's close to Cambridge, it's got an ability to be able to walk and cycle to existing local infrastructure, which is really important for all of all of our targets for creating good places and having an inclusive and walkable low carbon place that we can you know we can have is fit for purpose the 21st century as I like to say. Um, other parts of it really are that the development in North East Cambridge is 
actually possible as a result of an opportunity to relocate the Anglian Water Waste Treatment Plant, which has got a significant housing infrastructure bid, which is supporting that. So it is a unique opportunity really for Cambridge to have. It's, you know, it's one of the last brownfield sites within the area to be able to develop of this, this size and scale to be able to, as Terry said, to bring this mix of social council homes and also bring kind of this mixed use tenure, real mixed use feel about it and deliver kind of the carbon targets that we're really, really committed to doing. Um, and as I said, the national funding area is, is, is unique really. I think it's one of the biggest national funding bids in, in the country that um, has been secured through housing infrastructure fund um, to deliver the site through the waste water treatment works being relocated. Um, so it's important to be excited about it. I think it's it's one of the most exciting opportunities I can see at the moment, and I think that that's why we want to get everybody involved in trying to co-create the framework of doing this site. Hopefully, these to give you a chance to ask those questions if anything isn't clear about why we need to do this, and you know some of our team can get back to you on those answers as well. So I think then we've got one more question, I believe, that has been pre-asked and then we can move on. I can see quite a few questions in the question and answer box, so we'll move on to those next. But Terry, I'm going to hand over to you for this third one, which is uh, around green spaces. Yeah, thank you, Paul. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we'll, as, as Hannah again mentioned in the presentation, we'll be looking for a range of, a range of uh, green and open spaces throughout the whole of the area. So the main one is the linear park, which is essentially um, about a kilometre in length, and it goes all the way from Nuffield Road, all the way through the site, under the A14 and into Milton Country Park. Um, so that so that would be the kind of the, the focus of the kind of the green space in the in the, in the proposal. Um, it also links over the railway line um, into an area known as Chesterton Fen. Uh, now that's a um, that's an area that that's between the railway line and the River Cam. Um, and we think that it could be a really good, a really good place for off-site uh, informal open space, and it then give people access to the to the wider countryside along the towpath. Um, so we're really excited by that proposal. Um, we're also looking at uh, neighbourhood parks and um, sort of local green spaces. So those aren't really shown on any of the diagrams within the area action plan. Essentially, what we're showing on that plan is the, the kind of strategic, the, the large, the larger, the larger green spaces. What what those um, neighbourhood spaces would be would be within each of the development blocks um, that come forward, and they would all be publicly accessible, um, and they would make they would all form part of that green um, that green network. Um, so they would, those would include pocket parks uh, and also um, formal and informal play areas as well for children. Um, what we really want to do is create high quality, safe, uh, and green local spaces as well on people's doorsteps. So that's about thinking about streets. Um, the area action plan doesn't, you know, as part of this kind of, you know, low car, low car use, um, people friendly approach. The, um, the streets are basically designed, they should be designed um, to, be, to be spaces that can be used as well uh, for people um, to, to play and to socialize and, and, and that kind of thing. You know, cars won't be parked on plot um, outside of people's homes. Um, uh, and so it frees up a lot of space within the public realm um, for people to be able to use the, the space between buildings essentially in, in a much much more positive way. In terms of the private spaces, um, there'll be private balconies um, for for the new flats, uh, and those those will need to be designed to a good standard as well, where you know you don't have you don't have space balconies that are awkward shapes and you don't have balconies that aren't practical or functional um which is happening elsewhere so we've got we've got uh, robust standards in there to make sure that people have good balcony spaces there'll also be courtyard gardens um that would be set within um within uh, residential blocks um so um they'll be kind of for residents only uh, and then there's also opportunities for uh, podium gardens and roof gardens as well um so th there's quite a lot of um different ranges of open space um, that, that can be provided within the site. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question, Paul. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm just going to take over from Paul because his audio is a little bit dodgy at the moment um, and start running through some of the questions that are on the Q&A. Thanks for all the questions so far, which are really good, good ones. Um, 
will any of the land be made available for self-builders? So I think Terry has sort of spoken to that a little bit um, about how it's more about this self-finish approach than a sort of true self-build approach. And part of that is about the density of the site, that it's not necessarily standalone little plots of land which you can sort of buy, but it will be more typically about flats and maisonettes and you know more block structures. So I'm hoping that that one answers that. But of course, if you don't think that that's given you enough detail, please do ask another question in the chat about that. There's a question here about making the area a low or ultra low emissions zone. And I wonder whether maybe Matt, would you speak to that, do you think? Yeah, happy to. Uh, yes, I think ultimately that's where we're aiming for really um, in terms of being a walkable, cyclable neighbourhood where um, we prioritise walking and cycling over car use. Um, and certainly uh, what we're promoting in terms of public transport and by means of car clubs and other things will all be electric fleet vehicles. So we are looking at low emission zone um, that goes right through to the buildings as well and how we deal with uh, emissions from buildings. Slight challenge in that the A14 we have no control over, which is right next door to us, but um, would need to address some of those issues as well. I think it's worth saying on the on the matter of the A14 there's also a lot of work that's going into the air quality questions and the noise questions around that so there's quite a lot of detail that you can read if you go to the website and look at the sort of full documentation about environmental quality and how we ensure that new residents are sufficiently protected from any negative impacts from things like the A14. Um, next question is something about from the slide on headline figures What's the definition of genuinely affordable with regards to the housing? This is a great question that does come up a lot because, of course, we all think we know what affordable means in everyday use. But the government has kindly defined affordable for us more, more uh, technically um, through various parts of our planning system. So I'm sure Matt will be able to tell you all about it. Yes, certainly again. Um, so. In the context of NEC, genuinely affordable means we're trying to target specific sectors of, of the Greater Cambridge community in terms of um, those that um, are on our housing register and ensuring that we provide uh, social rented accommodation that uh, can meet their needs, right through to those that are struggling to um, either find rented accommodation or um, homes to buy. And so it's looking at how we can assist specifically key workers and others in the community to access housing within NEC and ensuring that, uh, as Hannah's already said, the government has um, given us uh, definitions of affordable housing. But within those definitions, it's ensuring that we target those uh, that require our assistance in terms of uh, getting onto the housing ladder or getting uh, rented accommodation that that's affordable for them. Um, and, and that's the full gambit of uh, or range of people, if you like, from those um, on our housing register to those that are key workers struggling to find uh, local accommodation. Thanks, Matt. Um, next question, am I right in thinking that the houses will be located next to the current business units located in the science and business parks? Terry can probably speak to this a little bit more. Do you want to take this one, Terry? Sure, yeah. Uh, so it's a uh, yes and no, really. So essentially, we're looking at um, putting residential uh, or homes in the um, Cambridge Business Park. Uh, so that would um, that, that's the bit that's closest to the guided busway and Cambridge North Station. Um, but we are not looking at putting any residential development in St John's uh, Innovation Park or Cambridge Science Park at this stage. Thank you very much. There is a question here about cycling and walking infrastructure and new government design guide LTN 120. I'm sure some people probably won't know what LTN 120 is and might want to know. So maybe Matt, if you're going to take this, could you just explain for everyone's benefit what that is? Yeah, as best I can, I think. I think L20 is, is essentially putting in railings, really, to segregate cyclists from pedestrian and traffic movements. Um, and we are looking at segregated cycle footpaths, in particular on main routes, um, away from, from any vehicular traffic and pedestrian traffic. Whether we use railings or not, um, it, typically railing is, is a design response um, to an ex extent situation, if you like. So, and it, um, whereas we're, we are designing um, NEC from scratch, really, 
And so there's an opportunity to look at different ways that we could um, provide for that segregation without necessarily putting up railing, which then provide, prevents, if you like, um, or, or feels like some of it's more enclosed. So we think there, there is a way of addressing segregation that may not require railing. I think if you look at if you go to look at the area action plan in a bit more detail there's two sorts of streets primarily that we're looking at in the area there are what are called primary streets which are the main routes for vehicle traffic um, through the area as well as for cycling and walking and on those ones you know it is a very strong steer that they will be completely segregated routes. Then there are what are known as in the, in the plan as secondary streets and those are no through routes within the residential areas where primarily there will not be car traffic except for very essential traffic if you are a blue badge holder and certain delivery traffic and things like that. And on those we're looking to Dutch and Belgian examples of what's called Wonerf streets which is a really kind of fantastic and it's totally normal in the Netherlands it's just that we haven't really managed to do it yet in this country very successfully in many places which which is an approach to slowing down car traffic so that essentially any vehicle that does come down there has to go at walking speed and that makes it incredibly safe for people who are walking and cycling in the areas. There's a question coming up, it's uh, a tweet on the talk, sports and leisure strategy for Cambridge and South Cams, have we read the plan and stated, started considering how our development will meet the shortfalls of sport and leisure facilities, especially large swimming pool and sports halls. Matt, is this a, a you thing again? Yeah, I'm happy to take this one. Yes, we've read it um, and we're working with our colleagues who are obviously developing the um, uh, the Greater Local Plan as well, Greater Cambridge Local Plan, and between us we're looking at how we can address those shortfalls, where the best locations for these facilities would be uh, or could be located to serve the greatest population really. Um, so and then obviously development, wherever it is, will contribute towards its provision. Um, within NEC, we do see there being a role certainly for sports halls um, within the scheme itself, uh, in particular associated with the, with the schools. Um, but we're looking at leisure facilities as well. Uh, we have not said no to a swimming pool as yet. Um, again, we're located beside the station, so would would be prime in terms of connectivity, guided busway and everything else. So um, it, it's just deciding uh, with the shared planning service, the best location for these facilities to serve the greatest population. Yep. Thanks, Matt. Next question is about what assessment have we made of previous large developments as Cambridge has expanded, going back to Romsey Town in the late 19th century, the Rock Estate pre-World War I, Chesterton into war, Queen Edith's and Arby post-war and Orchard Park 21st century, what has worked and what has not. This is a really great question actually because it does sort of set, situate what we're doing in, in North East Cambridge in the context of the historical development. I think it's something that Terry's going to speak to because they've been doing a huge amount of work on what we call in a sort of geeky way typologies essentially. Um, so Terry over to you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, yes, so we have been looking at um, sort of recent developments in and around Cambridge um, to see what has worked and what hasn't worked well. So that includes, um, we've looked at what's been happening in Orchard Park um, and as well as some of the more central developments as well, like CB1 around Cambridge Station. The, across the organisation, so environmental health, housing um, and, and really trying to understand you know what has worked well and what has happened what hasn't worked well so you know the whole range of different things from you know car movements and you know traffic all the way through to antisocial behavior and and the such like so we've been working really closely with them uh, and trying to understand what the key issues um, and how we can try and make sure that we don't repeat those mistakes but also learn from the positive as well and and in addition to that, we've also been looking elsewhere. So we've looked at examples from London and other cities across the UK, um, as well as cities across Europe as well, to understand what this type of development, which, is, which will be different to what has happened elsewhere in Greater Cambridge, um, as to how we, can, how we can learn from those best practice examples as well. So yeah, so if you uh, go onto our website, 
uh, and have a look at the Northeast Cambridge typology study. Uh, that sets up lots of different examples of how you can achieve high density mixed use development in a successful way. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of um, good images and, and um, lots of facts and figures in there. So it's, it's a relatively easy read for a planning document. I'll post the link for that into the Q&A here as well, so that that's easily available. It is a really, I have to say, of all the evidence-based documents, I think that's probably the most accessible and, and really great. Um, another question about what percentage of the plots will be available for small building firms and how will we avoid a monoculture of bland blocks, which is another really good question. Um, Matt, do you want to pick up on this or Terry? Maybe. Maybe Terry, I think Matt's connection is going. So maybe Terry, can you pick up on that? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Right. Uh, okay, so the um, the area action plan doesn't actually identify the percentage of plots that are being made available for small firms. Um, but what it does do is it sets uh, really high design standards in terms of making sure that we achieve uh, variation in building design. What we really, really want to avoid is building heights that are all exactly the same, all of the developments look exactly the same. Um, and there's absolutely no sense of, of place really you could be you know you could be anywhere essentially what the plan does is it sets um, a number of criteria um, that make sure that whenever developers are putting applications forward they have to show how they are positively responding to the local area to make sure it has a, a you know a cambridge feel to it which is a really important part of, of design um, and also making sure that it is also um, uh, well articulated and that you you know you aren't building big boxes and that there's lots of things like front doors and, and windows and things like that to make sure that you know you create places of uh, that are really well designed and not just basically you know anywhere sort of really. I think we're also really keen that we look at design review processes and we're having a review of that at the moment to see what the best way of doing that is and also how communities should be involved with that and I think that's a really important part of the area action plan is saying that community involvement isn't just at the plan making stage with us now but it will go through into the detailed side of the development. Next question, um, how can residents stop it altogether? Very good question, I'm glad that people are being challenging because that's what this is all about and I think Matt maybe you can speak to that if you're back online with us. Yeah, sorry everyone, <laughs> got cut off. Um, Yes, how can you stop it all together? I'm not too sure we, you'd want to, mainly because um, the developers or the landowners, if you like, um, can bring forward development applications at any time in the absence of a, of a plan to, um, uh, to build out their sites, really. And they already have, in terms of the science park, already have uh, planning permissions for certain things and, and Others are obviously looking at bringing forward planning applications shortly. One of the purposes of having an area action plan is that it's not written by the developers, but rather it's written uh, by the local councils on behalf of the communities that we represent. That includes the obviously the businesses and, and other people that are around. But um, so I'd, I'd strongly encouraging people to, to get involved and to have their say on the plan. Um, it's more a chance for us to shape the places, the future of the place, um, and to ensure that um, it's being led by the community rather than being developer led, and us having to then respond to applications that come in that we don't think is appropriate, that don't deliver on the aspirations that we might have for the place. So. Thanks, Matt. Next question. We've got lots more, so I'm going to try and whiz through these as quickly as possible. What are your plans to ensure the buildings are built to an environmentally friendly standard and aren't at risk of overheating in summer? Will any of them be built to standards such as Passive House? Um, the short answer is, yeah, we have got lots in the plan about this. Um, and Emma Davis, who's our fantastic sustainability officer, has been working really, really hard on this. Terry, do you want to just say any more about that? We may have lost theory. Um, uh, yes. No. Yeah. Back sorry. On. Uh, a bit there. I don't know if it was my connection or yours, but uh, yes. So you can get very, very high standards for Northeast Cambridge. 
can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll turn my video off, that might help. Okay, so in terms of environmental standards, yes, we're setting a really high bar um, and we are really looking to push, push um, developers um, really hard on, on, on environmental standards. So that's not only about the building design in terms of passive house standards, but it's also in terms of things like water usage as well. So that's really important. It's not, but it's not only about residential development, it's also about commercial development as well. So we are, again, uh, aiming to set a really high bar when it comes to new commercial development and make sure that it achieves what is known as BREAM excellent and BREAM outstanding. Um, um, to make sure that, you know, the new development, whether it's residential or commercial, um, you know, is, is the best it can be in terms of environmental standards. And I think if you're interested in that subject, you please do read policy two, which is the climate change proposed policy, because that do, does talk about the cooling hierarchy and some of the more technical sides of this. So essentially reducing the internal heat generation of the building um, and also overheating through passive measures first, rather than any sort of cooling system, which is basically only as a last resort. Next question is, will there be electric car charging? Again, I think that the short answer to this is yes. Um, it is really important. We also have a, um, we have a, a number of policies around um, the, the provision for smart systems, so kind of smart city technology. Matt, do you want to say any more about that? I'm aware we've got not much time. I'd quite like to whiz through a lot more of these, but if you've got two seconds. Yeah, just two seconds. Uh, yes, 100% electric car charging. We are anticipating the direction of travel in terms of all cars being required by government to be electric in the future. Um, development here will begin to reflect that and we anticipate that we will need to provide all uh, electric vehicles with charging points. Thanks. Next one is, are we at all involved with the St Albans Rec redevelopment? And if so, will the new houses be needed alongside that development? Terry, is that something you're able to speak to? Or um, I would maybe have asked Paul, but I'm not. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, no, so we're not, in, we're not involved in that. <laughs> right. um, I believe that's the, the council. The council, as a um, as a as a, I suppose a, a landlord in some ways, they're looking. At, I believe they're looking to redevelop um, some of that land around the Meadows Community Centre. Um, but no, we're not involved in that. Um, this we are we are the local planning authority. So even though we may we may look like we're, you know, from the council. We are, but we are the local planning authority as opposed to the council as a, uh, as a developer or as a uh, housing provider. Yeah, it's sometimes quite difficult for people to understand that, in fact, when the council puts a planning application in, we have a massive Chinese wall down the, 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 the council between those of us who comment on and decide whether that should be approved and the side of the council that wants to put that in. And in fact, sometimes councils do turn down their own applications yeah. for those reasons. Have we learned the lessons from the Great Northern Road by the station where estate agents sold apartments with balconies only to open out onto what is one of the most polluted roads in Cambridge? Yes, I mean, I think, that, yeah, as Terry mentioned, we have been looking at a lot of these issues in quite a lot of detail and trying to do better. We're always trying to do better and learn from things in the past. I think we have a really fantastic opportunity here to have this holistic approach to development that isn't just looking at one issue in isolation and as I mentioned there's quite a detailed proposal around environmental health which includes things like air quality to ensure that that doesn't happen. Does anybody else want to add anything to that before I add, go on? No, so I'd like to get through all the questions if we can. What arrangements for pool car use will there be? What is the direction of travel for private transport use, e.g. the rapid rise of electric scooters, much smaller electric engines and new battery tech? So yes, um, maybe someone just to stop me talking all the time would like to talk to this. Matt, do you want to just talk about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so certainly, yes, we're looking at extensively at pool car use because um, essentially we want uh, people to still have access to a car should they need it. Uh, and a pool car provides that service, if you like, and ensures that um, people don't need their own car, can reduce the amount of car parking on site generally as well. Um, and uh, in terms of obviously electric scooters, we're looking at electric bikes, we're looking at all different types of things. We're looking at storage battery cells as well. 
to assist and aid in ensuring we can uh, promote electric fleets and vehicles. Yep. I'm aware that for some reason some of the anonymous comments have come to the bottom, so we're actually just going to pick them up now because they have been hanging around for a bit and definitely should be answered. Um, I think picking up on that point about cars, actually, there's a question here. Discouraging car usage around the local area and Cambridge definitely has its merits. But for those that still need a car to, for instance, visit family further afield, these anti-car sentiments are rather off-putting. Will houses have sufficient parking spaces so that cars aren't pushed out to existing streets? I feel like Matt and with some of the other answers, we sort of answered half of that question, which is to say you will have access to a car. This is not about banning cars. This is about saying you should be able to use a car when you need to, but as much as possible, you shouldn't need to use a car to conduct your daily life. If you do need to, or if you have special needs, of course, you'll be able to do so. The question about pushing out to existing streets, I don't think we have totally answered in the preceding questions. So maybe um, Terry could talk to that just very briefly. Yeah, just briefly. So um, that's a really good point, And it's something that we're really, really keen to avoid happening. Uh, I think there's already some issues with um, some of the businesses on the site already with parking spilling over into North Cambridge and into areas of Milton. Um, so we're, we're really keen to make sure that one that, that you know, that doesn't happen, um, you know, anymore with, with the amount of development that, that's being proposed here. So we're working really closely with um, with colleagues across both councils and also with the highways authority for the area as well um, to see what we can do in terms of making sure that parking isn't pushed into other areas um, around North East Cambridge because um, that is definitely an issue that we need to make sure it doesn't happen. Thanks Terry, I think I'm going to try and pick up now. We're going to little tag team this a little bit and see if we can work out how we do this best. If I cut out Hannah will jump in again. Um, so another we're going to pick up a few more of the anonymous attendee ones. What, um, what, how we ensure that carbon neutrality, not just in the use, but in the build, will be considered through the development? So I don't know if potentially Terry that wouldn't pick that one up. Cool. Oh, okay, it's probably one for Matt, but I'll try. <laughs> so yeah, so as part as part of the. Um, as part of the policies around um, carbon reduction and, um, um, and um, construction in general, we're, we are looking at making sure that we factor in all of the kind of the carbon issues that, that go with, with development. So it's not just about the end user and how much carbon a, a building might produce, but it's also about how much uh, that is generated as part of the development, as part of the build. So we are, again, as I said, we're, we're trying to set really high standards in terms of this to make sure that all of that's being captured uh, as part of that kind of life cycle, really. Matt, I don't I know if you want to add anything to that. No, no. Is that right? I think just to add to that, Terry, I think the, you know, the councils, both South Cambridge and the city have committed to, you know, some quite challenging targets around zero carbon, and that's going to be reflected in much wider policy than certainly within the emerging local plan, which will affect both authorities too. So there's significant work there how we go about reaching those targets over the next few years, and it's something that we're very focused on. Um, so another one of the... Anonymous attendee questions. What counts as the Cambridge film it refers to? Hannah, do you want to do this one? Sure, I think it's a really, really good question. Um, so part of that is about the sense of place and the really important views and, and the landscapes around the site and how the design responds to that. And we, as Terry mentioned earlier, we are really, it is really important to us that it, it creates a positive impact on the environment and it isn't just about sort of, you know, reducing impacts, but it is actually distinctive and, and wonderful in its own right. We have this sort of saying that, you know, we love our old heritage, but all of our old heritage was new once. We want to be creating the really great new heritage for our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren, which we will treasure, or they will treasure in future generations just as much as we treasure what's been built in the past in Cambridge. So I think what, one of the things is obviously around things like materials and light and what is the right kind of colour palette and so forth for the area. But it is also about actually saying this is a really high quality design. We want the best architects and urban 
urban designers and landscape designers to be designing buildings here so that we're really proud of them in the future and we are definitely working hard in our you know with our wonderful urban designer colleagues in our team as well as with things like the quality review panels and english Her um, sorry historic england as they're now called and so forth to make sure that that meets that bar and we've embedded design very centrally in the policy framework for the draft area action plan to say this is not an added extra this is actually about what makes the place in the first place none of this other stuff the net zero carbon the transport strategies the cycling the walking none of that is made possible without really fantastic design that's what makes places which people are going to be really proud of in the future yeah, I think it's a really, really important question. And I think, you know, it goes back to Matt's point earlier on around the need to have a framework to have a cogent development coming forward that really is a place based place, if you like. So, yeah, it's a really important question. Um, so another anonymous one. Will any arrangements for the proposed metro be included in the design? I'm going to go to Matt for this one. Yeah, sure. So, yes. Uh, in essence we are we've done um, quite a few workshops to try and ensure that uh, obviously we want the metro to be an interchange with the main station and with the guided busway and uh, to access uh, the town centre as well uh, that's proposed so we're looking at the right location and we're allocating site for that um, and obviously we we're talking with the landowners about how that might be best accommodated uh, and how it might fit in really well. Um, we're looking at station design as well, which will be underground, how you facilitate ease of access and seamless movement between the Metro and the other um, different transport modes as well. Thanks, Matt. I'm gonna go through some of the earlier questions as well now, try and, try and, try and get a few more in. We've got about another eight minutes. So I'll, hopefully we can get through them but as i said we'll, we will definitely be picking up and answering these questions on the website so so keep asking them as it goes um i've got a question here saying can vehicular access from the area to chester and fen be considered at present it's really isolated to the wider area so again i'm going to go, go to you matt if you want to pick this one up or ter terry's best place i think this one might be terry do you want to do this one chester and fen we are, I can, well, we, we have been looking at it. Um, in particular, we're looking at um, and how we might address the, the um, obviously the level crossing there, uh, closing of that, how, um, how that might be addressed by network rail in terms of addressing any severance that may be caused in the future and whether NEC has a role to play in facilitating that. Great, thanks, thanks, Matt. Um, so you'll see some slides coming up now, which gives dates of some of our up and coming web webinars. So you just got some information, and in a minute, my colleague will also put on some of our communications channels, so you can make a note of them. But whilst we're still doing that, we'll still still try and work through a few more questions um, that we have still here, because we still got quite a few to answer, and we probably won't get a chance to finish them all today. Um, so another anonymous question what kind of cycling parking will be provided for residents and visitors bike hangers and secure cycle hubs like waltham forest anything else and i think i'll hit terry for this one please uh yeah sure yeah so in terms of cycle parking standards we're looking at um, a, a much higher standard that's currently in the local plans for the two areas um as we've said a few times already that you know we're, we're really trying to encourage as many people to walk cycle and use public transport in this area um, so yeah so we're setting much higher standards what we're also trying to do is make sure that we um, can accommodate what is quite a quite a common site in Cambridge and that's the kind of the non-standard bikes so thinking about things like the cargo bikes um, and, and those kinds of things because you know they are a really key feature of Cambridge and you know they're really a really important method method of transport for people in this area so we're making sure that we set a really um, really high standards in terms of the amount of provision that we allow for those types of non-standard bikes to be accommodated as well in terms of the wolf and forest uh, mini holland principles uh, yep we've done uh, a bit of work on that and then that that particular scheme is actually referenced in the document itself in the area action plan uh, you know, they're, they're doing really exciting things down in Wolfen Forest around the Mini, Ho Mini Holland work and, you know, those principles are, are definitely something that we're looking to apply in, in North East Cambridge. 
Cheers, Terry. Um, I'm going to pick up another question here, which is, I think, is a really, really important question. So, what conversations have you had, or will you be having, with local children and schools, especially on street design, park design, playground design, and housing design? And, and what community facilities would they want? Now, I expect, suspect most people will be able to answer. So I'm going to go to you first, Hannah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's this really important question and it's not just about now, but it's ongoing. We have been doing some consultation work with schools and colleges in the area. So we have uh, one of the evidence based studies is something called essentially it's about the kind of cultural planning, cultural infrastructure around the um, Northeast Area Action Plan. And as part of that, there were actually consultations done in some of the schools and colleges around the area. And actually they were really fantastic. And they, they were literally telling us what communal facilities do people want in the area? What do these young people, because it is of course all about young people, this plan, what do they want to see? And if you look at the cultural placemaking strategy document on our website, you can have a look and see what they were saying. But again, this goes to how we're going to develop the place going forward. And that's where the process is really important. And what we're saying in the draft plan is that your development process must be consulting and engaging really meaningfully with local communities. And that absolutely involves young people. We've, we're building really good relationships with uh, Cambridge Regional College, of course, but also Cambridge North Academy um, and also the community groups around the area who've been involved, such as NCPCP. And we will continue to be working with them and getting their young people involved as much as we possibly can. Thanks, Hannah. Um, next question. Um, will buildings be timber framed as recommended by the UK CCC? Um, does anyone want to pick this up? Uh, yep. So the the plan doesn't specifically mention uh, timber building, timber frame buildings, but you know they obviously have a very high environmental uh, credibility, uh, sort of uh, credibility. So that's definitely something that you know we would be looking to to develop at Northeast Cambridge. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, and we're also looking at um, other other types of construction as well. So thinking about modular housing as well, and how that could actually be built kind of in a factory and then delivered on site as well. You know, those types of housing. So not just thinking about you know bricks and mortar in terms of the standard in a standard way, but actually thinking about how we can do things that are more in line with kind of um, existing and emerging um, building technologies as well. Great, thanks. Three minutes. I reckon we've got enough time to answer another couple of questions here. So um, have a look at the screens for the details of how you can get in contact further with us as the consultations open. But um, I can't leave this one, leave this one not answered. So note the long term plan on water stress in Cambridge is continuing to grow um, and increasing total water use for the city. How are you going to contribute towards water saving given your high density? It is not a public record that the tributaries of the river can are demonstrating symptoms of water stress. I think that's a question, not a statement. It's, um, Terry, do you want to pick that one up? I can. Um, uh, yep, sure. So yeah, in terms of water issues, yeah, no, we're absolutely aware of the current situation in and around this area. Um, so there's a couple of things that we're doing. So first of all, we're doing a water cycle study. Uh, and so that is looking at the much wider picture, not just Northeast Cambridge, but Greater Cambridge in general, uh, and uh, looking at kind of water the water as a resource and how it, um, you know, that's affecting our waterways, so chalk streams, you know, River Cam, uh, and other waterways. So that's a piece of work that's being done as part of the local plan. Now, in terms of Northeast Cambridge, um, again, you know, I've said a few times now that we, we are really trying to set a high, a really high bar when it comes to things like this. So the area action plan says, you know, we will be looking to to meet sort of 110 litres per person per day, which is, is essentially the national standard. But what it does do, it says, well, really, we were looking for more than that. That should be the very, very minimum as a last resort. We should actually be working much more towards 80 litres per person per day. Um, and obviously, you know, one of the sites involved is, is Anglian Water Site. So, you know, they, you know, they can, you know, they, they've got a lot of um, best practice and, and things as well as how we can try and achieve that. So there's a lot of positives there in terms of water usage. Um, looking at it from a slightly different angle, thinking about um, open space and, and landscaping in general, you know, one of the things that the Area Action Plan seeks to do is to make sure that we, we create uh, landscapes that are sort of drought tolerant really um, one we've got you know climate change and you know 
we've got hotter summers and sort of drier winters so that's something that we need to make sure that, that we are making sure our landscapes can adapt to that um, and just making sure that you know that they are you know good pleasant high quality places throughout the year um, and and not part of the problem really in terms of needing to make sure that they're really well watered um, um, and and adding to the problem really Terry, thank you. And I think on that note, it's um, seven o'clock. So we, we've answered, I think it tells me we've answered around 23 questions. I think there's another six questions left. So we will definitely answer them um, and then we'll put them on the website and all of the detail, um, what we talked about tonight and the recording will be on the website. And I should note that a lot of these questions are quite specific to individual topics. So if you have a look at those topics, you, you, you will have some different experts. It won't just be, you know, I don't like to call myself an expert really, but certainly my colleagues are. But, um, you know, it will be a, a number of people who will be able to answer these questions, in, you know, maybe in a little bit more detail. Um, so I really like some feedback on tonight's session. It's been our first one. I think I'm aware from my own looking at it that we've probably had some audio and visual issues i'm not sure we can solve those with personal wi-fi problems but um certainly i'd encourage you to kind of complete the feedback survey once the q a closes and so we can improve the next remaining seven because we will be taking that into consideration to reiterate and um, and i thank you all for those attending and asking questions thank you to all of our colleagues for being here and tonight and getting this up and running um, and hope you get a chance to participate in future events scheduled. Um, and as I say, everything's on the website. If you want to get people to talk about it, please visit the website, visit social media. And I hope that you all have a fantastic evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>